to take away from tonight's cooking class. Usually we give people a couple of minutes to kind of trickle in while we do introductions, but we have a packed agenda tonight. So we are gonna keep it to one minute and then we're just gonna get things rolling right away. Um, again, if you're looking for Cook for the Climate, you're in the right place. My name is Aiten Salahi. I'm the executive director and founder of the Planetary Health Collective. And my co-leads and I put together this organization, Cook for the Climate, so that we could have an earth-friendly cooking class and an awesome conversation with leaders in the space who are equally as passionate as we are about bringing sustainability to the forefront of all of the work that we do. So you are one of those people. We are so grateful to have you here tonight joining us for this event. And with that, we are gonna go ahead and just get started because we have a delicious recipe that we need to get straight away with. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the agenda so you all have an idea of what it is that we will be doing tonight and the flow of events. As I'm going through this, please feel welcome to still introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name, where it is you're calling in from and what you are most excited about from tonight's event. I also just wanna let you all know, please feel welcome to update your pronouns by toggling over the top right-hand corner of your Zoom square, clicking rename and adding your pronouns in right after your name. So um, again, welcome. My name is Aitan Salahi. I'm the founder and executive director of the Planetary Health Collective. And the PHC is an organization comprised of food and nutrition professionals who are passionate about leveraging their unique skills, their platforms, and their careers to bring sustainability into the forefront of the conversation when it comes to food systems work and nutrition education. So thank you so much for being here. We are all about community. So having you attending our events means the absolute world to us. This event was made possible in spark, uh, by our sponsors, Wonderful Pistachio. We're so grateful to you guys, not only because um, you've helped us to get this event going tonight, but also because of what a strong partner you are in building sustainable foods and honoring your commitment to both health and sustainability. So in a minute, I'm gonna pass it off to our sponsors to share a little bit about their sustainability approach. But first, I have to introduce you to our co-host for the evening none other than Chef Jamil Arzino. So I'm gonna read you this bio and then I'm gonna give you like 10 seconds to pick your jaw up off the floor because she is that incredible. Jamil <laughs> is a professionally trained chef who has managed and cooked in fine dining since 1996. She has had an illustrious career which began with an apprenticeship in Le Grand Louvre in Paris after receiving an associate in hospitality management from New York City College of Technology. She's worked as a pastry chef, a manager, and a consultant in the New York restaurant scene with internationally renowned chefs. And she's also consulted on restaurant openings, menu development, and staff cultivations with restaurants all over the world. In addition to her work as a chef, Chef Jamil has taught as an adjunct professor for Monroe College in the Bronx. And she's also been a workshop coordinator, speaker, and panelist for organizations like the Restaurant Opportunity Center, which if you're not familiar with them, is an awesome group that supports food service workers who face work workplace injustice, as well as the Start Small Think Big organization. She also started her own private catering business in 2014, and her current passion is around teaching kids to cultivate their own inner chef through an organization that she built called Chickpeas Inc. Um, she has also served as the first culinary director of the esteemed James Beard Foundation since October 2018. But beyond all of her incredible work accomplishments, she is a mother, she is a daughter, a Bronx, New York native, and a dynamic, creative, passionate individual who believes in honesty, transformation, love, and the power of food. So Jamil, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are so honored to be learning from you. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, guys, I was having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I'm trying to like put the sound where it's supposed to be, but thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Aiton, for having me and for inviting me to do this amazing event. Thanks so much to the Palm Company for providing all the products and their sponsorship. It's really an amazing opportunity, and I'm so happy to do this with you guys. I don't do a lot of this, so you're going to have to be patient with me with my tech skills because they're not the best. <laughs> That's okay. You're doing amazing. We're so, so happy to have you here and we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to enjoy this amazing, delicious, like I never thought that I would learn how to make pastry cream, but here we are. And it's also plant-based, which is amazing. So 
thank you for being here. Before I pass it off to you and we get started on our cooking class and conversation part of the event, yes. I'm going to kick it over to our sponsors um, so that they can share with us a little bit more about how wonderful pistachios and the wonderful company work to honor their commitment, not only to human health, but also to sustainable food systems. So wonderful company, take it away. Thank you, Aiton. Thank you, Chef Jamil. We're so excited to be here. Hello, everybody. I'm Maggie Moon. I'm a registered dietitian. I'm Associate Vice President of Nutrition Communications for the wonderful company. You may know us. I have a couple of visual uh, aids here. You may know us as wonderful pistachios, palm, palm wonderful, wonderful halos, or more recently, wonderful seedless lemons. Um, those are some of our healthy produce brands that you might be familiar with. If you are, um, let us know in the chat what brands you've tried before, what flavors, especially maybe of pistachios that is your favorite. I'm joined here today by two members of my team, Catherine Sebastian, a fellow dietitian, and Leslie Dominguez, a public health professional. And we are really thrilled to be here to learn from Chef Jamil how to make something low waste, high delicious, plant-based, win-win, highlighting pistachios and pomegranate juice. And I really just wanna say thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to our hosts and our illustrious uh, chef guide here in a moment. And to my friend and colleague, Mary Purdy, who made the initial introductions. So thank you. And I just wanna share that the wonderful company is all about doing well by doing good. And um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I just want to preface that this slide has a lot of words. Don't worry. <laughs> Ultimately, this is just a very brief overview. We have a whole CSR report available publicly online if you're interested in learning more. But essentially, this is an overview of our commitment to environmental sustainability, um, like a shift to 100% renewable energy, um, use of recycled materials in our packaging, and a major gift to Caltech to fight climate change. Talk about planting a tree in whose shade you will not um, sit, right? So looking ahead to um, what's right for the planet. Um, and as growers and farmers, if you go to the next slide to um, pistachios there, we are growers and farmers ourselves. We um, produce a lot of our, our pistachios and pomegranates right in the Central Valley of California here where I am. Um, we are stewards of the land. And so we do things like water conservation, being really responsible with our natural resources, um, which is of course good for the planet, but it, it also reduces waste and cost for our business operations. So it really is truly a win-win for everybody. And we've invested in real-time drip irrigation as an example, so that our trees get all the nourishment that, he, that they need. Food takes water to grow, right? But nothing in excess of that. And so speaking of operations, a good portion of our operations run on solar, we also utilize alternative pest management systems like pheromone-based deterrents that don't actually help harmful bugs. So if you go to the next slide, a little bit on palm, we do a lot of the same work for palm, wonderful. But one thing I wanted to share is that we're really active in uh, seeing what we can do with our waste product, um, which seems like a, a negative way to call something that we can really get a lot of use out of, but really it's about using the whole fruit so of course we're selling the whole fruit for all of us to enjoy. We whole press the fruit for juice, but then we're using up some of those leftovers for animal feed. We're actively looking into how do we kind of chop it up into small particles to make something like a pomegranate fiber that might feed some of our internal um, populations, microbiome. And then we're also looking at biofuel um, ways of leveraging some of that, that quote unquote waste. Um, so, that's a little bit about what we're doing. Again, we have a whole CSR report that we're happy to share with you. Um, and just thank you so much for being here. I think we all wanna get to the cooking. So I'm gonna pass it back to Aiton to get us where we wanna go. Beautiful, Maggie, thank you so, so much. And thank you again to Wonderful Pistachios for sponsoring us and getting this awesome event out there. We've heard from so many people in our community that people want to learn about the connection between human health food and climate. And so we wanted to package that in a way that is fun and delicious and interactive. So that's exactly how Cook for the Climate came to be. And so we're hoping that you all have a great time with us tonight. And without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get started. So the way that tonight's event is going to work is that I'm going to go ahead and pitch a question to Chef Jamil, and she is going to show us the incredible multitasking skills that she has cultivated over the two decades plus that she's been um, an executive chef. And um, she's gonna walk us through each of the components of our recipe. So by this point, 
Um, if you are attending the, you know, the live event, there will be people watching this recording later on. You've also, you've already been prompted to begin prepping the recipe by making your pistachio pastry cream and your pistachio paste. So go ahead and make sure that you have that out. And for the first component that we're going to be working on together tonight, it's going to be the pomegranate gelée. And Jamil, my first question for you is just to share with us a little bit about your thought process as you were developing this recipe. What, where did the name come from? What does that mean to you? And how did it feel when you were asked to pull together a sustainable recipe for a sustainable cooking class? So for me, um, pulling together something that was a sustainable recipe was kind of daunting because I heard that word sustainable and it kind of was like, ooh, you know, I have to like um, do something like really serious and it has to be very vegan and healthy and all of that. And it kind of scared me a little bit because I don't normally do vegan things. I have been developing vegan recipes for my repertoire just because I have clients who have allergies or who are becoming vegan or who are already vegan. And I wanted to be able to just offer more so that I can have a larger client base. Also, you know, when I was working at the James Beard Foundation, I was exposed to vegan chefs. Um, and I found that it, I really liked a lot of the flavors. I liked um, a lot of things that they were I just didn't know were possible that you could do with food and how you can manipulate it to like get textures and consistency. So it was interesting to me always. I came up with Chato um, because it was also about sustainability and it was also about, um, for me, sustainability is about holding on to culture as well. Um, it's about creating new conversations. And so for me, Charo was somebody who did that. Um, she's Latina, I'm part Latina. So it was important for me to bring my culture into it somehow. But um, for some time, a lot of people don't like take women very seriously in, in a lot of industry. And Charo was one of those women. And so what she did was she put everything else forward and she became the Gucci Gucci girl. And then she showed people that she was a classical guitarist. So, you know, she gave them the other view of what they didn't know was there. And then she kind of slid under the radar and showed them who she really was. So I just thought that was like really exciting. She was just vivacious, she was spicy, you know, and that's what I wanted to put into this dessert. Um, also, it was something that I never thought I would do. It's, it's vegan, you know, I'm not a vegan trained chef, but I use the techniques that I knew and I know um, to try to get something that was a product that I think that I would like and that other people who are not vegan, but maybe want to transition to would also like. So that's how I got that. So should I go over the products that we're using today? Yeah, I use the recipe. So for this recipe, I used the lightly salted from Palm Wonderful. I also use pistachios and I also use the, the chili, roasted chili pistachios. This is the one that's the dominant one. This is the one that we use to make the pastry cream. So I rinsed these first, even though it said lightly salted, I wanted to get rid of most of the, as much of the salt as I could. So I rinsed them first um, and then I let them dry in just the colander. So I just basically took them to the sink, rinsed them off, let them dry. Um, if you wanna capture whatever liquid you rinse off to use in something else so that you don't waste it, it's good liquid that tastes really good. I know I tasted it. Um, <laughs> I put it into a smoothie, but you can do whatever you need to do or whatever you want to do with it. Um, we're also using the pomegranate juice from Palm. And so I use that to make the gelée. Okay, tonight we are using agar flakes. I use agar because it's sustainable. It's made from seaweed. So I use those flakes to actually put the gelée together to try to bind it. Um, you can, I'm also using arrowroot for the pastry cream, the pistachio cream. So that's another binder that's natural. There's no pork product or things like that in it. Um, I am using tonight organic coconut palm sugar. And I am also using organic cane sugar. Now, um, why did I use two different sugars? Well, because I didn't remember that I had some palm sugar. And so I started out with the cane sugar and then I found my palm sugar. And this is about sustainability. And for me, sustainability also means that you have to use what you have. You don't waste it. Um, it's also about your wallet. If I already had it, why am I gonna go out and buy another product? So I'm using what I have. Okay, um, and so that's 
pretty much I had cocoa nibs too. And I love the blend of chocolate and, and heat, anything spicy. So I wanted to incorporate that since we had the um, roasted chili pistachios. I knew that that spice was going to be nice with the cocoa nibs. So I wanted to incorporate that into the product as well, just to give a little extra layer of flavor. So let's go into making the pastry cream. Can we do that? That sounds perfect. We have a couple of questions from the audience real oh, quick. So okay. first is, can you define gelée? Uh, and we can do that once we get to the part where we're making the gelée. Okay. And we have another question about um, the agar agar. Oh, somebody just mentioned that it takes less power when using agar too, which is amazing. Okay, go ahead, take it away. Sustainable, fantastic. Okay, so I have measured out some of the stuff already just for the sake of time. So we're just gonna move over to my stove area um, and just step away from this and leave the palm with you. Jamil, yeah. quick question for you. Do you think that folks should go ahead and preheat their oven now, later for the phyllo dough? Um, you can. I the only reason I didn't do mine is because mine heats really fast. So you can go ahead and put your don't preheat it to 375 for Perfect. your phyllo if you want to do that. I'll do mine too. Why not? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. But it's just that mine makes noise. Can you still hear me? Because that noise is going to be like annoying. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. You're good. Okay. I'm going to turn mine off anyway. Um, because I can turn it on after when we move over. Okay. okay. I'll turn it on at the end. Okay. So I already measured out the sugar for this is for the pistachio pastry cream. That is going to be um, two out two tablespoons of the cane sugar. And you're going to do one cup of one cup and a half of the flora plant dairy-free multi-purpose cream. Um, Flora is what I use because I know it. I learned about it when I was working at the Beard House. I really loved the product. I thought it was amazing. So that's why I use that. Uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can drain it into here. I was gonna do it into the bowl, but I'll do it in here. I have a small bowl, yeah. Let's do it little by little. So I'm straining that, which you probably would have done already. Um, and what I did was at the end of this, I decided that I was not going to waste these amazing, delicious pistachios because why, why do that? I love pistachio. I think they're delicious and amazing. They're one of my favorite nuts. Um, and so after I drained all the cream off of them, I went ahead and rinsed them, let them dry and then found another use for them within the product, within the dessert. Um, I wasn't even going to use them the way I did, but I figured like, well, how can I make two products with the same pistachio to go into the one dessert and like really make it a sustainable pastry? So the rest of that, I will just rinse off. And a few of them did escape and get in here and that's okay. They'll add flavor because I can strain it again at the end, but yeah. I rinsed these off basically. And what I did was after I rinsed those, I let them dry. And that's what I made the, um, I make the pistachio paste from that. So just rinse the cream off of them, let them dry. And then you'll come back and make pistachio paste with that after. So for that, I put in the two, um, the two teaspoons of the cane sugar Okay, and I have my plant cream I'm putting in with the little scapees that got in there. You can probably see it from here, from the other camera. And I'm gonna warm that. So while that warms up, I'm going to grab the little ones that escaped, sorry. No, that's okay. Jamil, this is so helpful. So for the people who prepped your pistachio cream in advance, I don't know if there are other newbies to the pastry cooking world like myself, but I was like, how thick is it supposed to be? What does it mean for like the cream to be pulling at the side? So that's exactly what Chef Jamil is walking us through right now. 
Um, so this is like the pro tips that we're getting from the James Beard chef right now on how to actually make this. And I also love the step that you included about not wasting the pistachios and saving it for another part of the recipe. Yeah. And I mean, it didn't have to be for this recipe, but I figured why not? Because I, I, there's other parts of the recipe that I saved that actually didn't go into this recipe. They went into other things that I found used for. Okay. Um, so yeah, so my sugar was already in the pot because I just, for the sake of saving time, and I'm just letting this get hot and melting that sugar down. The other thing is I want this to get warm so I can pull some out of it pour it over my arrowroot and then I kind of like do it like you would like a slurry mix it and that way then reincorporate it into the main quantity here in my pot Got it. it's already getting hot I'm going to scoop some of it out brilliant so um Chef Jamil, does every yeah. chef just have crazy biceps <laughs> from like whisking stuff all day? I think most pastry chefs do, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was like really amazed that I was like, man, I'm gonna get a workout from this right now. Yeah, I think most pastry chefs do have great biceps. <laughs> that's always like a kitchen joke, like show me your guns. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, so see, I did a little thing there. Can you see that? So yeah. it's a little blurry so that you don't have any lumps. Oh, that's great. Okay, good. So what she's doing now is you're just whisking to get the arrowroot clumps out. So it's a smooth cream. Yeah. So I just wanted to do the arrowroot separately because it's not a product I work with often. And I wasn't sure how clumpy it was going to get, like on um, touching the liquid surface. So I wanted to incorporate it like that. This is great, so helpful. Okay, scraping everything down. I have my prepped pastry cream right here and it just smells so good. I cannot wait to try this. Okay. This is a big pot and I didn't make a huge, large recipe. So as you can see, while I'm whisking, you can start seeing like little bits of the bottom of the pan because it's thickening. So it's like pulling on my whisk. But you're gonna see it starts to get creamy, kind of like a melted vanilla ice cream is the best way I could describe it. Mm. But when you start seeing it kind of like pull from the edges, I don't know, it's gonna do it shortly because I can see it. See how it's moving from the bottom of the pan already? Like you yeah, can yeah, see yeah. the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be done in like less than a minute. So in the meantime, I'm going to pull out my juice because I want to measure and I'm going to have to like rinse because I don't have a, a dishwasher person. So I'm going to have to rinse my measuring cup real quick, but I want to put um, a quart of the pomegranate juice over here and let the agar flakes bloom on it. So I put half a quart actually, and the agar flakes that I measured out were three level tablespoons. So I'm going to let that bloom on top. See the bubbles there? Now, I'm sure that you could actually make a pistachio cream with pistachio plant-based milk if you want to, if you had a high power, like um, professional like blender. I don't have a Vitamix here. I want a Vitamix. If anyone wants to donate one to me, I'm happy to accept it. I love gifts. Um, but if you had a Vitamix, you could actually put the pistachios in with water and make your own cream, like your own pistachio milk, if you would. So this is pulling from the sides for me a little bit and it's getting a little bit tighter and you can see that. Oh my gosh, Jamil, you have a taker for the Vitamix. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you. I love you, whoever you Thank are. Thank you to Ashley. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Send it to me. And give you my info. See, this is the most beautiful community. We love you guys. Thank you. But I also heard that I'm, I would need a nut bag. Now, um, see, these are the things I'm learning. I think maybe in maybe a couple of years, I'll be sometimes vegan, like partially. We had a conversation about that. I was telling Aitzen, you know, I could probably go vegan if I did not love butter, cheese, and pork. But <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> I, I mean, give it up for like about, months. Yeah, no, there's like such a cultural component to all of that as well, which is like part of what we wanted to chat about today too. Just like, how do you stay true to your culture and your roots and the way that, you know, animal food is respected in your own culture? Um, and where do we also focus our energies when we're talking about which parts of the world really are over consuming animal products and which ones are not really contributing to the climate crisis, right? Right. So um, with, with the way I was raised, you know, we respect the animal. Um, you use all parts, you use the whole animal. You don't just use the part that you're gonna eat that day. So we don't just get the pork chops and eat the chops. Everything gets used. And I was sharing with IT like for Christmas when I would go home to Puerto Rico, we would get, my uncle would have a pig and a goat and they would actually be part of what was gonna be our holiday meals. And my cousins and I would all be like, do you guys see how this is pulled away? Yeah. yeah. And you see how it's thick? Mm -hmm. So for me, this is good. You can go a little more if you're not comfortable or sure that you're going to get a nice thick pastry cream. But right now, you're good. This is good. Like if you're coating the back of a spoon with this, which you probably would be, I could probably show you, then you're good. So I'm going to pull this off the flame. And I will show you, let's see, this spoon will coat the back of this spoon, and we should be good. Perfect. See how nice and thick that looks, but let's do it anyway. Yeah, see that? That's what you want. Got so it. that's good. Take that off the plane. And the other reason I, I made this recipe portion so small. Um, I'm going to be an empty nester, so it's just me. And I didn't want to make a ridiculous amount of pastry cream that I was going to waste because my son is very fickle and I didn't know if he was going to eat it. So please like do it times four or times eight for whatever size of family that you want to do this for or for yourself, whatever, because this pastry cream can be put in the fridge. It can be stored. So I'm going to put it now in a bowl so it can tighten up. But you see that, right? You see the little, the whisks on top of it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to scrape this down, get it into a bowl, get it into the fridge. Um, yeah, but back to using and incorporating every part. We, they would purchase the animals for the holiday meals for the entire holiday. And we would then use every part of the animal. Now, I didn't eat every part, but like the casing from the intestines were even used to make blood sausage, to make regular sausage, like to make whatever they needed to make. But um, there was nothing wasted. So we really honored the animal. Okay. So that's so fantastic. And it's also, I mean, pulls me back to one of the origin stories of Planetary Health Collective was a report from the Eat Man. Hello? Sorry about that. No, I just got cut off for a second. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to share that's totally in line with what you said is kind of a piece of the origin story as you're rinsing off that, um, the measuring cup about how the Planetary Health Collective started. There was a research report that came out from the Eat Lancet Commission, which is a major commission of some of the leading scientists in the sustainability space, showing that yes, in general, in the global population, reducing the intake of animal products is best for both human and environmental health. However, some regions in the world are way overdoing it more than other regions, and we need to be focusing on those regions. And North America is really where it comes down to reducing animal intake. So, you know, Tell us a little bit about like your cultural upbringing as well, like where it is that your family is from. You mentioned that you're part Latina. So tell us a little bit about that. And everybody keep in mind too, there's this regional specificity when it comes to talking about sustainability and sustainable eating habits. Yes. Well, um, my family is, half of my family is from Puerto Rico and the other half of my family is from the Carolinas, North and South, from my dad's side and from my mom's side from Ponce, Puerto Rico. So even in my dad's side of the family, like there was no waste with food. We just, culturally, we were not brought up to waste any part of any animal or anything. I mean, we didn't have the luxury of wasting food. Everything had to be eaten because we needed to feed mouths and we needed to stay, save money. And that's what sustainability was for us um, and for my family. So that's why we did, you know, for me, it's natural to not waste things. 
um, I find that the restaurant industry had so much waste, but then there were people like the people I met from Rethink who came, Rethink Foods, who came from um, Chefs from Noma, who decided to like take food that was being wasted and recreate it and make something that was sustainable and that was able to feed people, um, you know, who weren't getting meals. And I thought that was amazing. And when they did a, a dinner at the Bayer Foundation with all waste considered material, it was like mind blowing for me. Like that was a real turnaround for me. And that's what really made, had me consider like, okay, um, there's even more ways not to waste stuff. That's fantastic. And that's the Rethink organization? Yeah, Rethink, Rethink Foods. Rethink Foods, let's get that out it. so people can take a look at them. Yeah, awesome. they're amazing, the, the things that they do. They also would pick up whatever, like um, after every event that we would have, whatever the chefs left over, they would come and pick it up and again, re rework that food, rework whatever the leftover items were and make meals to serve the homeless. Wow, that is so, so incredible. Such a valuable use of, you know, what's so interesting. You mentioned earlier on, you're like, I kind of have a problem with you using that. Actually, it might've been Maggie who said like calling certain things like food waste when it's still such a usable part of the ingredient. Right. Right. Um, there's been this like interesting movement around using that term versus using the term wasted food because one indicates that one, like it's garbage versus it's actual food that we can still be use, using and just not to waste it. Right, agreed, agreed. <laughs> yeah, there's, we're, we're there's so many now. changes in terminology. Yeah, totally. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the gelée portion. So I have here, um, I have used, I'm gonna use, at the port. Okay, so I need a little bit more. Look, shy of Here we go. Four All right. two cups. Well, by the way, so, two cups, half a quart. Two cups, so half a quart. So, um, so here's the thing. Again, like this is not a juice that my son would drink and I don't like to waste anything. So I was like, how do I use this whole bottle? I could have just drank it. Yes, I know that. But I wanted to, again, like use the entire like unit so I took this and cooked it down and made uh, a syrup, if you will, to coat the plate with, so like a sauce. So I used that as another component for the dessert as well. I'll show that to you guys. And I just added to that like some rum, and so that's that. So I made oh, that I syrup. Love that. Oh my gosh, look at that. That looks so good. Yeah, no, another piece of sustainability that's not talked about. When you have that tiny little bit that's left in the container, don't toss it, do something with it, make something with it. Exactly, exactly. And to that, like I added a bunch of stuff. I added a vanilla bean, I added an anise. I mean, whatever, some wine, I added rum. It's like, it's like a little baby sangria sauce. So <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just awesome. do whatever you wanna do with it. You know, make it fun. Okay, it. now I did not measure out my agar. I did put the sugar in there and I don't want to start the agar. So I'm going to put the tablespoons that we need of the agar on top of the pomegranate juice to let it bloom a little bit. The three level tablespoons. Hang on, I'll be back. And I think you can still see from this camera here. So just in case. I have to tell you, when the agar flakes um, hit the liquid, the smell was not the best. I was a little nervous. What is it? What did it? Oh, let me see. I can't smell it. Oh, no. <laughs> what does it smell like to you? So, yeah. And, it, and then it went away. Oh, interesting. Cool. Yeah, okay. but it smelled like the sea, and I was like, oh, dear Jesus, I hope it doesn't taste like the ocean. <laughs> but I was like, no, that wouldn't happen, because I mean, I use it in other desserts, so no. Yeah. Awesome, okay, great. So we're just doing the three tablespoons of the agar flakes into the pomegranate juice, and then we let it hang out. 
for five minutes. And then let it hang out and rest there for about five minutes, kind of like to like rehydrate, absorb some of the liquid. All right. And so in the meantime, I want to get this into another container, but you see that nice consistency look. Mm. It's already like, you know, ready, but I want to get it chilled. Now okay. I'm actually just going to add that to one I already did and I already have it in a pastry bag. Um, let me just put my little clip down here so it can save this. All right. So done with these things, this now I'm going to add also a little ginger to that. Um, once I get going, I'm going to add some powdered ginger to it because that was another little seasoning thing I wanted in there. Components. And I'm going to rinse that up one more time so I have some cream on there. And I'm going to let these dry. So I already had my dry um, pistachio and what I did with my pistachios once they were dry, because I'm going to dry these and probably use them for some cookies um, that I'll make later on the weekend. But the ones that I let dry, I pulled and mixed with palm sugar. And I made with that, just pulse it with palm sugar equal portions, and I just made this pistachio like nut bar roll. Mm. And I'm gonna mix this with the plant butter and make like a pistachio pastry cream, not a pastry cream, I'm sorry, like a, um, just like a pistachio cream that I could use in between the layers of the phyllo. So let's do that. Okay, so we are we moving on to the pistachio paste now? Um, well, I do, I'm gonna do that really quick. Okay, great. We lost your audio for a second. I think you're muted. Jamil, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. So that's just for the pistachio paste. I'm just moving over to my mixer here. Um, okay. Because I just wanted to get that done since I have the five minutes. For the um, pistachio cream, I'm sorry, the pomegranate too. I'm just gonna put my pistachio, this is already the log that I made of the pistachios that were left over with the palm sugar. Okay, awesome, okay. So while the agar is developing, we're just gonna move on to the next step where we're making the pistachio paste. So for those of you who prepped a little bit in advance, we had already put together some sugar with pistachio, blended that up, pulsed it. And now we have that paste we're about to, I think blend it up with a little bit of plant butter, right? Yep. So um, just, that's about like a stick of butter. So that's how much plant butter I'm gonna put with it. Okay, okay. Cool. equal parts sugar to butter, right? But the nuts with the sugar, that mixture of nuts and sugar to the butter, yes. So it's just like when you make a, um, an almond paste, like for marzipan, but you're gonna do it with pistachio. Got it, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself while I blend so you guys still have hearing at the end of this. <laughs> I hope mine's not that loud. It should be okay. Oh gosh, I have to plug it in first. That would help, right? So we're gonna use this to put in between the layers because at first I was just gonna layer it only with um, grape seed oil, and the nuts that I had crushed down and the um, coconuts. But then I was like, why not? Let's make it gooey like candy. It's a dessert. <laughs> Dr. Meal, one of the things that surprised me in this recipe was the choice to add in additional like chili flakes, but it's so good. Like that combination of the cacao nibs and the chili is so surprising and so balanced. Can you talk about like what inspired that combination? Had you just cooked with that combo a lot before? Um, 
No, but but I have family that's from Mexico and I have family from Venezuela and chocolate mixed with chilies is a thing. Um, and it's a thing that I love and I've grown up loving. Um, you can even find it in the mole recipe. There's, that's chocolate and there's chilies in there and it's like spicy and delicious. Um, and it just, it's a natural compliment for me. So I, if I get an opportunity, like one of my best sorbets I made was, a, a, I call it red hot chocolate. And it was just a chocolate sorbet that had cayenne pepper in it. So it was like, kind of like, oh, I'm eating this very cold thing that's really, really hot and spicy. People loved it. You're completely speaking my language. I find that I'm always adding chili to things, but adding it to something like an ice cream, a sorbet is so, so, so smart. I love that. I can't wait to try that. So yummy too. Okay, so that's done. That's literally all you have to do. Okay, and it smells, oh my God, it smells so good. It smells so <laughs> good. And I'm going to just show you real quick what it should look like. Awesome, okay. Great. So that you just want to scrape that down, um, get it into a pastry bag. And I thought about this again, like maybe you don't have pastry bags because you just don't make pastry or things that require pastry bags. If you have Ziploc bags, um, I can't tell you the number of times I've turned a Ziploc bag into a pastry bag. That's super smart. I was going to ask you what to do if you don't have a pastry bag. Yeah, you, I, I have taken a Ziploc bag and put stuff in it and then cut off the tip of the corner, meaning like. Would it be okay if you don't have Ziploc bags either? I've just like taken it, like put it, whatever I had to right there and then like kind of just squeeze it up and just cut off the tip right there and made pretend like it's my pastry bag. That's fantastic. We have some people in the audience who are saying that they've done that trick before too and have loved that. So that's- Exactly, awesome. exactly. Use what you got. Um, what you got. If, if, if you don't have one, hey, I mean, I don't know. There's always something. There's always something. That, the one thing I love about um, having worked in the kitchen is that chefs really know how to MacGyver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's so interesting because even though like on a larger scale, there's a lot of waste in the restaurant industry, chefs mm -hmm. are some of the most creative people when not wasting a single piece and having that intellectual curiosity to experiment with different components of the food and the ingredients that you're using. Right. Exactly. I think a lot of the waste that happens in the restaurant, like in, you know, more upscale restaurants is not necessarily, um, intentional as far as equipment use or ingredient use it's more like um somebody came up with this dish and they imagined it this way and it looked this specific way in these shapes and that's where the waste component comes in you know oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so All right, I'm going to save this. You could put it straight into a pastry bag. Well, actually, I'll put it straight into a pastry bag. I have one available. Um, and then we'll put that away. So we're going to go back to the pomegranate jelly. And basically, it's just a gelatinized juice. And we're going to cook that up because that's already settled. And get this in this bag. Okay, so turn on the heat for the gelée to start kind of cooking. Yeah, you can. I'm gonna go over there and start doing mine. Okay. But whisk it first. Okay, and you think medium heat for like five minutes or something? I think medium heat, yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Now, somebody had asked us earlier, what exactly is a gelée? So do you wanna answer that question while we're making the gelée? It's, it's like a gelatin. You're just making a gelatinized juice. You're taking something, a product that is a liquid, a juice product, and you're turning it into a fruit-based product, usually. And you're turning it into something that's gelatinized. So you don't want to call it jello. Yeah. <laughs> basically, it's what you're doing. Okay. So is it the same thing as jello, but it's just called gelé? So you're just going to use a thickening agent. 
that will make it like a gelatin. Okay, so that is my, um, cut that and leave that for later. And I'm gonna actually put it in the same little bag I had made, just to keep it moist. I put that in my fridge, just that. Okay, all right, that looks great. So you see how the flakes of all I kind of like blended in and absorb liquid? Yeah. Awesome, get my flame on. I've already made a bag of my pastry cream. Um, I'm not going to make another bag, so I'm going to take that one and just scrape it in. Okay. So while the gelée is cooking on the stove, do you want us to be stirring it pretty frequently or can we just let it sit? I would not stop stirring it. Okay. Um, only because I just don't want it to get comfy or lumpy in any one place. I mean, if you do stop for a second, that's fine. Keep your eye on it because gelatin tends to take form very quickly. Got it. So was this the first time experimenting with agar agar for you? And, and if so, <laughs> would you? <laughs> Were you nervous to play with it? It was my first time experimenting with the arrowroot. It was my first time experimenting with the agar. It was the first time I ever tried to make a pastry cream, if you will, uh, from non-dairy milk. Uh, it, there was a lot of firsts. Like, I, this totally came together only because, again, that word sustainable, like, like, I was like, oh God, I have to like really think now. Like it has to be like vegan, it has to be like all the things. And I just, you know, but it was great because it, it had me to think in a more a different resourceful manner. Totally. And honestly, um, Chef Jamil, like a lot of the people in our community are, I call them like plant, plant-based curious, like, or vegan curious. And so they're very much in the same place. And I, I'm, you know, I put myself in that category. I'm not hundred percent vegan, but I've been on this kind of journey myself over the past several years to try to adopt more plant-based things and experiment more with vegan ingredients and see what I like. And so a whole lot of our community is in that same boat. So we're right there with you. And for me, this was also outside of a food science class that I was required to take um, before becoming an RD. This is like the first time I've actually cooked with agar agar. <laughs> that's awesome. See, yeah. that's, that's the thing I love about food. Like somebody says, can you make me this? It's like, if, then, if you've never done it before, it's like, well, let me test my boundaries. You know, yeah. yeah, and I love that. Yeah, and I think like you mentioned earlier, like the word sustainability and plant-based and veganism can feel really intimidating to people, especially when there's like a cultural component towards like respecting the animal products and incorporating them into some of your food. So we're all about making it like a inclusive and exploratory and experimental kind of approach and like having a curiosity about it, I would say. So this recipe is perfect. Okay, I have to also mention, this is getting pretty thick on my end. So should I take this off heat? If yours is getting thick, if you can dip your spoon into it again and coat the back of your spoon, then yes. Sweet. Okay. And again, if, it starts so, looking, if it's looking like saucy, yes. Okay, awesome. I, I think I'm- I don't mind thickening. Got it, okay. So if there are other people who are like in the same boat with their gelée as me, is now a good time to spread it over uh, a baking yes. sheet and start yes. cooking it? Yes. Awesome. And before you spread it on the baking sheet, you can take, um, just so that it helps you lift it up, I'll show you what I did. I wrapped my baking sheet before I put the gelée in it. I wrapped the base of my baking sheet in plastic. So my baking sheet's wrapped in plastic. Then I drop the gelée onto that plastic, see? So okay. that I would be able to like lift it up and out. Okay, let me do that real quick while you're finishing up with yours on your end. Yep. And I'm going to lift that up now onto another baking sheet so that I can actually use that one again with new plastic. Okay. 
consuming from this camera, which is great. I let that go in the zoom because mine is not um, thickening quite as quickly. So check in with the participants real quick. So who is cooking along with us and how is your gelée coming along? Let's see in the chat. I'm checking in over here in the chat to just see what is going on. Wow, this is a very active chat. I'm so happy to see it. We have Ashley mentioning how she puts tahini on ice cream. Oh my God, that sounds good. Tahini on mango is one of my favorite things ever. Uh, Bretta is cooking along with us. Her gelée is almost ready. Yay. Yay. This is so exciting. Thank you guys for being here. Oh, this is so fun. Are you kidding? Thank you so much. Honestly, I don't know if I would have had the courage to like to try a recipe like this by myself, but with your leadership <laughs> and your guidance, I'm doing it. Awesome. <laughs> it's not that bad, right? No, it's not that bad. It's it like, you know, when you see the different components, you're like, oh my gosh, can I do that? But then it's not too bad. So yeah. more. I tried to do some a recipe that again was also sustainable for me. Sustainability also means something that doesn't take up like a whole lot of time that you can break up into parts and days if you want to. Um, and that doesn't overwhelm you because you gotta have peace of mind to sustain. Yeah, totally. It shouldn't be something that you're stressed out about. It should be something that you're looking forward to. And I think that's part of what we wanted to achieve today too with folks is like, okay, so let's go for it. Let's make a vegan pastry dish that you may never have seen veganized before or plant-basedified before. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to let mine oh, just like just the fridge. second because it's not thickening as much as I thought it would. I okay. might over add it, but I might, I don't think I let it heat up fast like to the temp I need it. So let me just rinse this while you're doing that. Okay, no worries. While you're doing that, you have a thank you from a participant saying thank you for making it vegan. Yay, you're welcome. I, I wanted to do something that everybody could have. I mean, obviously, if you can't have nuts, you have to use something else. You couldn't use this, but um, not everybody has a problem with pistachio, so mm -hmm. gonna lower allergy nuts. <laughs> so that's great. So oh, then we also have a message from Maggie saying that she ended up using all three tablespoons of agar powder. Yeah. Um, I And she's lacto, lactose intolerant and I'm also lactose intolerant. So we're going to be feeling great after this one. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, this is great. So you mentioned earlier that you're getting a lot of new clients with your private catering business who are interested in plant-based eating or who have allergies. So is that a new trend that you're noticing? People have a specific interest in plant-based eating? Um, for me, it's it's new. Uh, I didn't have clients that had this many like issues with like, I can't eat this. I can't have that. I found that I'm allergic to this. I don't know if that's from pandemic issues or if that's just like because of climate change. Yeah. Um, but I do know that, you know, I, I can't say like they're, they're making it up. It has to be true. I know that when I moved from New York to Florida, I became allergic. I had worse allergies than I ever had when I got to Florida, which was weird. But um, that's what happened to you. Maybe it's just a matter of changing spaces or places. It's the climate change. Yeah. all of those factors yeah it is really interesting so there was a recent report out from the food institute that one of the top investments to be making was in plant-based foods like plant-based mm. ingredients plant-based cooking um anything like that because people are not only interested in more plant-based components for the climate aspect because it's a more climate friendly option to eat plant forward but also because it's exciting. I think people are interested in this new budding industry and there's so many new products that are coming out um, that support them in their health and it, or in their health and in making more sustainable food choices, which is like an exciting place to be, I think. That's awesome. One yeah. thing I do want to tell you, and I don't know if I wrote this in the recipe, don't pour your hot liquid straight onto the plastic. Um, I always strain everything first before I pour it into the container that it's going to set in just because I want to make sure that everything has melted out or been whisked out. Um, I don't want anything left, no lumps. I want everything nice and smooth and the texture to be right. 
Okay, got it. So I'm going to uh, this first into my measuring cup. And then I'm going to let it cool a little bit before I pour it over the plastic. So my, I feel mine giving me now. Perfect. I had my plain, plain too low. Okay, no problem. Take your time. Ashley, we're so grateful to have you here too. Ashley is saying that she's very grateful to be here and thanking us for hosting the event. Thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. Thank you. I also wanted to shout out a really helpful pro chef tip that you included in your recipe card that you probably so normal for you, but to oh, me, I was, oh, that's really smart was when you had us put the film, like the plastic wrap over the pastry cream so that it didn't form a film on top. Yes, lay it onto it. So simple, but so helpful. I'd never thought to do something like that before. And I just took my wrap off and it looks great. Like it looks like I just made it right now and I made it a couple days ago. Yeah, and when you make anything like, um, if you make lemon curds as well, same. And if you make yes. ice creams, same. Do the same thing. Oh, okay. When you make, do you say ice cream? Yeah. Like if you're making ice cream before you put it in the fridge, you don't want that film to stick to your ice cream. You want it to go with the plastic once you take it out. If, like, if you have an ice cream machine that you use at home. Got it. Got it. Okay. And I also okay. do it on my lemon curd and my orange curd. Very smart. Very smart. Okay, I really appreciated that pump. So for those of you who have to leave right at the hour, um, we totally understand. We hope you can stick around for a little while while we finish up the rest of the recipe. That would be awesome. We're gonna just continue chugging along here and make the rest of the make the rest of the recipe, assemble the layers of the phyllo stacks, and um, continue on with questions while we're finishing up this gelée. So we're about to get Chef Jamil's gelée in the fridge to cool off. And while it's cooling off, I think we're almost ready to get started on the phyllo stacks, yeah? Yes, let's do that. So let me grab my phyllo. Perfect. And I'm going to get some, uh, an oil that's pretty flavorless, which I like to use is grapeseed oil, but there is pistachio oil. I wasn't gonna buy it. That's unstable for me to spend more money. So I just used the grapeseed <laughs> oil I had. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Flavorless and it works. Can I ask right. you a quick question about the oil? Yeah. So can you use a spray oil to make the in-between time, like where you're assembling the phyllo dough layers a little bit faster, or do you prefer Absolutely. brushing? Absolutely. Okay, cool. cool. Awesome. Um, you so can absolutely do that. But I also, you know, in again, going back to that whole, like the wording about sustainable. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking, well, I need to like make sure that I'm not even using aerosols. <laughs> like you like had me like, okay, I, I can't use anything like that. Yeah, detail oriented, chef. I'm like amazed. So, okay. Can I, can I ask another question about the phyllo dough as well? Yeah. So does it, is it really important that you go one layer at a time or can you do a couple layers at a time or what, what are your thoughts on using it for people who are new to using the phyllo dough? I say it's important to do it one layer at a time so that you get the nuts in between each layer so you have that crunch. You can do it two at a time if you want, but I don't think you're going to get like, because I put that cream in between that pistachio cream um, that we made sorry, the pistachio paste we made in between. And you're not gonna get that like sticking if you don't do it. I also, I mean, you might if you do the layering of the pan because I layered one pan on top of the other. Okay. So the thing about working with phyllo, um, you have to keep phyllo moist, it'll dry up really quickly. Okay. So when I work with phyllo, I always keep moist towel to cover the phyllo with. And when I say moist, I mean damp, not soaking wet because you don't want, the phyllo will get very wet very quickly too. Um, you want to leave it in the fridge so it's absolutely time to use it. Okay. Right? And let me get a pastry brush. That is so, so helpful about keeping it moist. So growing up, my family is from North Cyprus and we make a lot of baklava type desserts. And like uh -huh. the aunties are working so fast on the phyllo dough with like uh, butter. 
Right. Yeah. This is like fresh butter, but they're going fast, 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 fast. That's probably why. Yep. That's why they go fast. Amazing how fast they do things. <laughs> so okay. should you have my like freshman paper? Go ahead. You're read my mind. Freshman paper is going down first. Okay. And if it's a little bit too big, just fold it and then turn it over. The folded side is underneath. Like mine. There we go. That fits better. Okay. Then I already pre mixed my cocoa nibs and my crushed up, my chopped up chili, roasted chili um, pistachios. Okay. Okay. I also added a little bit of, you can add a little bit of um, chili flake or you can, cause I had ancho chili flake or you can have, you can add in a little bit of cayenne if you prefer that, or just a little bit of black pepper, just to kick up the, the, the chilies that are roasted into the pistachio already. Awesome. I did okay. some ancho chili powder and I added a Turkish uh, pepper, Aleppo pepper. Ooh, <laughs> yes. I love that. Okay, let me get my moist towel. I have one. So all these paper towels that I like have used that just I use to dry my hands, I take them and I just rehydrate them and reuse them. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited for this lay layering part because this is where it's okay. all coming together. We're making our stack, people. Yes. So are we, how are we on time? So we have just passed um, the hour mark, but I think it's okay. I think we're just going to continue on finishing up the recipe for those who are able to stay. We would love to have you stay. And we're going to, of course, upload the full recording for all the attendees who registered and have to leave right now at the hour. But I think we're probably going to wrap up in the next 15, 20 yes. minutes-ish. Um, so stick around if you can, and we love having you here. So please go ahead and continue interacting in the chat. It's been awesome to see what a lively, lively audience we have tonight. Thank you guys for being here. If you had to leave, I'm sorry we didn't finish faster. I tried yeah, and to make honestly, it as faster. <laughs> you mean don't worry about it because you know what? Like the whole goal is we want it to feel like we're hanging out in the same kitchen together, enjoying our company, taking our time. So that's what it is. Sometimes recipe takes a little bit longer. It's no problem at all. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Let me catch my brush. Okay, so I have my um, oil here. And basically, I'm going to start laying my layers down. So look at your phyllo because they tend to stick together. Um, yep, these two are together. If you want to double them up, like I said, you can do whatever makes you feel good. I like to do single layer for mine. And I'm going to go ahead and grab my pastry. Sorry, not the pastry cream. The, um, the pistachio paste. My pistachio paste so that I can go ahead and put it in between my layers. Perfect. Okay. So, so the pistachio cream will come in later. The pastry cream will come in later. Right. Okay. Pistachio paste is what's going to go between the layers. If anybody else is going lazy girl method and doing multiple phyllo doughs, uh, just know that I'm right there with you. I'm doing that also. <laughs> Gotta follow your heart. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So, and also, again, if you wanted to, you could add a little sugar to that mixture that I made of the... Um, the pistachio, the chili roasted with the cocoa nibs. It's up to you. Um, if you do add in a little sugar, use some of the palm sugar. Okay. And I also added a little fresh cracked pepper into that. You can add whatever seasonings makes your heart happy. If you wanted to add a little baby bit of cinnamon into that or nutmeg, I think that would be a great compliment as well. 
So I'm just going to mix this up, sprinkle it. So in between the layers, we are so putting the pistachio paste and then we're putting that ground pistachio mixed with the chilies and the uh, cacao nibs, yeah? Right. Now, if I don't know if you can see this, but what I did with my pistachio paste is I just did like little like rows, not too close together. And I'm just gonna like kind of smash it down once I put the next layer on. Just kind of like glue, if you will. Awesome, okay. So those are the things you said in the recipe to keep like about a finger's distance apart from each other. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. And then I kind of just like smashed a little bit. Okay, can I ask another question that probably the other newbies in the crowd like myself were wondering? Yeah. Is there any harm if you did like multiple rows with the pastry cream in it? Like is, is something gonna happen when you cook it that you don't want to happen will it overflow or something? So yeah, it'll, it'll, it kind of like grows a little bit. It, it inflates okay. and it'll like puff all the way out. So the first time I made it, I did that and it was like oozing everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, let me go a little bit off. wider. Yeah, smart. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, we're getting, I think, close here. And I'm excited because I do have some pomegranate seeds also for like a pretty garnish later on. Yay. So also, like when you do the, the following row, I alternate. So I go in between the rows I did before. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the pastry cream can kind of fill in. Yes, but it's on the next level. It's on the next layer, rather. Okay, cool. Okay, so part of what we have to do is we have to control for like the height, right, while we're cooking with the filo dough. So yes. that's why you do that? That's why I put that pan on top of it. Cool, okay. Awesome. Hold it down. How is it going, everybody? How are we doing? Um, how are participants doing putting together your philo stacks? Let's How's see. everybody doing out there? Oh, we have another question for you, Chef Jamil. Yes. So what is another traditional dish that you like to make from your culture, or from just growing up in your household? Ooh, um, I, it's, it's not vegan. Well, you can make it vegan, but you can make it vegan actually. And I found this out and I did do a version. Um, I love something that we call mofongo. And mofongo oh. is basically like, it's the green plantain that we cook, um, we fry it. And we usually take the leftover roast pork that we've had from the week and smash it into it with garlic and some other, you know, spices and seasonings um, and, and pork rind. But it's, it's like, that's like my little piece of heaven. I love mofongo. And you don't have to put pork in it. I have like um, done like mushrooms king oyster mushrooms and I just made sure they had a lot of good umami on them mm. and like cut them up like they were pieces of pork and like season them like they were pork and use that. That is genius. Have you ever tried using jackfruit as a meat substitute? So that's going to be my next experiment. <laughs> I feel like you're going to love that one because it's just you can dress it up however you want to. I think I'm going to love it too. <laughs> I have more really um, that perfect shredded meat texture. It's awesome. Has I, anybody out there, any of the participants used jackfruit as a shredded meat substitute yet? Let us know in the chat. It's one of my favorites. Someone said yeah. not yet. Someone says they have. Chef Breda says she feels very professional assembling these stacks right now. And I have to say, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I love it. You are professional, Greta. <laughs> Yes. 
Oh, Ash has used Jack or vegan tacos before. That's awesome. Oh, yes. Yum. Okay. Anytime I don't rip one of these phyllo doughs, I'm patting myself on the back. How many did I use already? One, two, I think I did four. <laughs> Maggie says, I feel like I have a crime scene. Same. <laughs> That's why you can't see what I'm doing down here. <laughs> a crime scene? What are you guys talking about? I'm sure it looks, it's probably fabulous. It, it's probably just, it's probably just the pomegranate juice. That's probably all it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am going to do two more stacks and I don't have any more cream. Um, I used all my, it's not cream, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, my pistachio paste. I used all of mine already, so I'm just gonna go ahead again and just do the cocoa nibs okay. with my pistachio. And I can add a little bit of, like I said, I want if I want to, some palm sugar, but um, I think I'm good okay, because perfect. I like the sweetness. So I'm gonna do just two more rows. I like the sweetness, how it was the first time I made it. It wasn't just, it wasn't overly sweet. And I really like that. Now what I did do is I put sugar on top because I kind of like, I didn't put this in the recipe, but I figured whoever showed up, they could see what I did, but I torched it. Ooh, are you gonna torch it tonight? I think so. Okay. <laughs> torch it. <laughs> I think I'm gonna torch it tonight. <laughs> see, this is what you get for coming live, you guys. Thank you, you get to watch exactly. Chef Isla actually torch it. Exactly. <laughs> Special privileges. I'm gonna have to get the powdered sugar for that because I wanna torch it with the powdered sugar. So, okay, for the top layer, you're gonna add, you're adding your oil and then you're gonna add sugar and then you're gonna torch it. And so when you're no, finishing- No, I'm gonna actually put another piece of parchment and put it in the oven. Oh, and then you're gonna torch it? When it's done, yeah, I'll torch it when it's done. And do you do more than one layer of phyllo on top to finish it off? Or do you just do one layer and it's done? One and it's done because I'm going to go ahead and put the sugar and I'm going to go ahead and put another piece of parchment. And also one of the things I realized that I didn't say in the recipe, or maybe I did, um, it might be better to pre-cut your, your, your portions if you want to pre-cut it. It seems easier to cut when the phyllo is um, uncooked. Okay. Okay, cool. I will go ahead and do that then because I can see this. So being I'm going to do mine. Um, matter of fact, let me see if my pillow, how is it? I'm going to roll mine up because it's pretty clean. I didn't do a dirty job. That's awesome. Yay. Okay, so I'm going to roll my phyllo up to put it away. Um, and don't keep your phyllo in the fridge. Please keep it in the freezer so you can maintain it. Make sure you wrap it really well in plastic or whatever your sustainable um, wrap is. Can I ask a quick question about the edges? Yeah. So if um, your baking sheet is like a little bit smaller than the actual size of the phyllo dough, do you recommend cutting off the excess on the edge? Yes. Cut off the excess, like very, you know, a little, like trim it as close as possible. Okay but keep it neat. Okay. So back- I feel like I'm performing surgery right now. Does anybody else who's cutting their edges feel like they're performing pastry surgery? Just FYI, back to my gelée. I'm yeah. just gonna pour this onto my pan. And like, that way it just might go in the fridge and let that set. Okay. Okay. So that's ready to set. I might let it cool a little bit more. Then I'm just going to put my bridge. But there, that's done. All right. And here, I'm going to put another piece of parchment paper. And into the oven we go. Now, you guys are going to wait for yours to cook. But I'm going to show you how to do the stack. Let me get this in the oven. And before I do, I'm gonna portion out 
how I want to do it. Um, so I'm going to cut my edges a little bit because I want them nice and clean. So I'm going to cut a little fine thin on the edge, but I still put them in the oven because I let those little edges bake and I eat them because oh, they're nice. good. They're good little snacks. <laughs> Bonus crunch. We have a question in the chat for you, if you have a sec. Yes. So Maggie says that a torch is on her birthday list. Do you have one that you recommend? Ah, um, I'm going to be honest with you, Maggie. Every chef that I've known, like some of the chefs use those fancy torches you can buy at Sur La Tabla. But honestly, everybody that I know usually uses a torch from like Home Depot. <laughs> the kind of welders oh. use. <laughs> Well, I love that because there's a Home Depot down the street for me, so I'll be getting one of those myself, too. <laughs> Hence my torch. <laughs> okay, so part the paper on top and then stack um, another baking tray on top just to keep it flat, to keep it flat. Yeah. Kind of yeah, after you push your, now you can do rectangular pieces, however you want to do it. Okay. Um, even if you had a round cookie cutter, but again, that's going to be waste. You're going to have waste unless you want to just eat them like Scooby snacks, all the, uh, all the parts around the round pieces that you like portion out. You can do that. It's up to you, whatever makes your soul happy. I am going to do probably, I think I'm going to do rectangles. I'm going for rectangles too. Yeah. And I think I'm going to do thin ones and all for the sake of my mom saying that I made the dessert too big, but she ate the whole thing. Okay. That was my favorite story. Just for the <laughs> record. <laughs> so for context, people, uh, Chef Jamil had her mother try this recipe just to make sure that it was good. And she was like, oh, no, the slices are too big as she ate the whole big slice. Yeah, so exactly. So we're looking at 15 minutes. <laughs> exactly. So you can measure yours if you like, like if you're like me, um, if you want them like even, super even. I use a ruler. I always have a kitchen ruler. ruler. I love that idea. <laughs> Sorry. No, pro tips. I love it. I will next time. But I always have a kitchen ruler for pastry stuff. If I did about two and a half inches, which is perfect, actually, because that gives me the three rows I want. <laughs> okay. Mine are gonna go in the oven now, we'll see. So who else Eat. is going in the oven right now? And remember, they're not a long time. I think we said 16 minutes? Yes, it's like 14 to 16 minutes I put, I think I put down. So like, depending on the heat of your oven, cause some people's ovens, you know, the calibrations are different. Yeah, okay. Oh, yay. These are going to be so sexy. I love sustainable and sexy. I, that's exactly, when I read your description of the charo cakes, I was like, that's perfect. The chili, the chocolate, the pomegranate, the pistachio, the green, the red. It is it's totally sultry, spicy, delicious. And one thing that I love too, is when you were describing like the origin of the name, you said it's like a little bit of a surprise. And I yes. think it surprised people hearing like the combination of those ingredients like you wouldn't necessarily think pomegranate pistachio chili and chocolate would be such an amazing combination right so i'm hoping that you guys all love this after you're done there that's done i actually fell in love with it that's done and then as soon as my oven says it's to temp i'm going to pop that in for the 14 minutes i'm going to give it a look and then um, if I want to cook a little more, I'll put it for two more minutes. But let's go on to how to build the stack. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the reason I, I bring up the flavor combinations because in my mind, I think that that's what makes a really, really good chef is somebody who can combine those flavors in a creative way. And it's like a courageousness with the ingredients because you know them so well and you know what they bring to a dish. So I'm so excited to try this and I'm literally counting down 14 minutes from mine. I cannot <laughs> Oh, that's right. You didn't make this parts before, so you haven't had it, right? So oh, here's yeah, I'm actually... Well, this is the great yeah. thing about Philo. Do you have like a um? Do you have a, a baking rack? 
I do not have a baking rack. Okay, well then you do you have another baking sheet that's not in use, like a yes. cool one? Great, mm -hmm. so because we put it between the two pieces of the parchment paper, you can easily pick them up off the, the hot tray, move them onto the cooler tray so they cool down faster because you don't want to put the cream onto the hot phyllo. Oh, okay, okay. Because it'll melt. Got if you're it. like okay. me, because I'm pretty greedy, I like to eat right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same, I will be right there with you. <laughs> Uh, amazing. Okay, so I want to ask you one more question while we're talking about the phyllo stacks. And so yes. one of the things um, we had such an awesome like prep session for tonight's event. And one of the things that we chatted about was like these different dimensions of sustainability and how there are certain parts of the meaning of the word sustainability that aren't really brought into the conversation often enough. Mm -hmm. And one of those elements that you brought up was this element of community. So making sure that whatever you are cooking has some kind of community element to it, something that people can enjoy as a unit. So can you talk about that? Can you talk about the community aspect of sustainability yeah. and what that means to you? For me, um, when I had when I was asked to create this dish, um, the first thing I wanted to do was like go all traditional as far as like what my training is. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a vegan puff pastry. And then I thought to myself, that's not sustainable. Like puff pastry takes kind of like two days. Some people don't have that kind of time, but they still want something like delicious and amazing that's gonna give them those textures. Yeah. So that's when I said, well, let me go to the phyllo because that's easy, it's affordable, you can go get it. Um, the sheets look like paper. So if you have kids around, they're gonna probably wanna get involved because it's like fun. It's like you're playing with paper and you're gonna cook it and throw sugar on it and things like that. Um, so then that creates like this sense of like, we're all doing this together. You know, it's it's something that's a team building kind of thing. It's like a family building kind of thing. You can like get around the table together to create this thing. Um, and it's something for everybody. It's an opportunity for teaching. It's an opportunity for learning. And I think that's important. That's that's part of the sustainability of a community that you grow together, that you learn together. Um, bread, bread together is really important. Mm, I have such a fantastic answer. And something that, that makes me think of from when we were chatting is also the storytelling aspect of food and like having recipes that you pass down from generation to generation and having food be like a way that you maintain tradition. Mm -hmm. Did you have some experiences with that as well? Um, I think that probably the, yeah, um, those experiences are going to be things like when my grandmother taught us how to make pasteles. Um, that is also a plantain-based food that's more of a Taino type food. It's wrapped in banana leaf. You have to actually grate the plants. It's, nobody does that now anymore. They don't do it the old-fashioned way. They just use a food processor <laughs> and grate the plantains down um, and combine it with the achote oil and all of that. But that was a, a like, it was painstaking and long process that like everybody in the family said, around the table doing one part like you you did one part you pass it to the next person who did the next part and that it's part of tradition it's part of our culture it's it's something that unfortunately is being lost and I think that uh, most cultures have an item like that that's something they remember from their childhood or their grandmother or their great-grandmother made that you're not seeing um, being cultivated in the newer generations and so it's important to like even get with your friends and, and like you were talking about how you use the fetal with the baklava and things with your family. Like that might've been something that you guys did as a family during holiday. Do you still do that? If you don't like, you should be the one to bring that back. Like don't, I think those things are super important. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that those, that's what um, helps us maintain a curiosity about where we come from. Yeah, Jamil, I totally agree with you. And I think like when we talk about sustainability, it can be so easy to get caught up in the, the policy or the like, you need to go get the all of the reusable stuff from the fancy no waste store and whatever. But what you mentioned is exactly what it comes down to is like, what can you do to sustain the parts of your culture that are meaningful through your food. And that in itself is an act of sustainability because you're bringing different lenses to the food world that need to be preserved, maintained and shared with the rest of the world. Like an example yeah. that comes up to me is there's this Turkish dish made with like fresh green beans. And so the kids would get involved by, you would give them like 
big bowl of green beans and their job was to peel like pick off the ends then the yes. aunties would take it and they would peel the edges and then the, you know somebody else is working on the garlic somebody else is peeling tomatoes and exactly community. but you're also you're not also, you're not just creating like something that's sustainable as far as your culture and your history you're creating sustainable memories family yeah. memories that no one will ever let go of you know yeah. that's where home that's the sense of home that you want to build mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And part of the goal too with all of this is yes, it's sustaining culture. Yes, it's building memories. And it's also getting people back in the kitchen. Like there's such a loss of kitchen skill, I think in general, which is why I'm so excited to hear about the project that you're doing with chickpeas. No, am, is it chickpeas or is it chic peas? Because it's spelled Sheik. like chic. Okay, it's, it's chic peas. peas. It's chic peas. <laughs> it's chic peas. <laughs> I gotta tell you. So like, because everybody thinks peas are plain but peas can be very fancy so that's why i call it chic peas i love that and little kids learning like five star chef skills is like chic peas exactly exactly okay so i'm i have already portioned out my filo cakes these are the ones that i had already pre-baked and they are ready to go. My other ones are in the oven. I see Pamela has hers out or she has something out. Pamela, what do you have out? Oh, that looks so good. It looks like she has her gelée out. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so here's my phyllo that's ready to go. Um, I got to get some powdered sugar. Hang on. No worries. Take time. Mine is going in the oven now. I can't believe that I can say that I made a gelée. <laughs> Ways, how is it going out there, everybody? Who else has got their gelée ready to go? I'll be right back. Take your time. I got to climb for my powdered sugar. That's okay. I'm just popping in the chat to see how it's going with everybody. So my delay is going in the fridge now, my new okay. one. Okay. Okay. Got it. I'm just going to read off a really cool um, thing that Bretta just shared, which is that she works with kids with autism spectrum disorder. And now she has so many ideas of activities to do with them around food. Yay. <laughs> I love it. Ali Landsman also said, building a culture of celebration. I love that. Okay, who was it that said that they think they have a crime scene going on? How are we doing at the crime scene? Uh-oh. What kind of crime scene do you have? What's happening? Well, we're checking in. We're checking in on the crime. Yeah, we're checking in on the crime scene. We're What's going on with the crime scene? <laughs> it's turning into an episode of Law and Order. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Dad, no, please, no crime scenes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. You said it's in the oven now. The filo dough was a disaster. Um, I too have a filo dough disaster going on in the corner. It's just out of shot, so I can relate. <laughs> I'm actually gonna try this gelé, so I think I made mine like a little bit thick. Okay, but it's almost like. So, remember, I told you I had I was torching some of the tops of the phyllo. So look at see how the layers here. Can you see that? Anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that crunch that's in the layers that we made from that um, the pastry the paste the pistachio paste, which is so yummy when you get those little layers of crunch. I just love that. I can't wait, I can't wait. Okay, so first I'm gonna torch this a little bit. We have a question. Um, how firm is my gelée supposed to be? Your gelée, it's supposed to be firm, like a jelly. Hold on. Okay, I'll just share what mine looks like. I don't know if this is how it's supposed to look, but mine actually looks like one of those fruit ropes. <laughs> so your your gelé should not be ready at all now if you just made it with me, unless you have like a deep chiller, because it's going to take a while to firm up. You see, it's like, it's literally like a jelly. Like I can, it's like 
we used to call it membrillo. It's like you make mm. like a like a um a jelly type of paste. So you see that? So you should be able to like pick it up. Yep. Yeah. I think I might have put a little bit too much agar gel because mine is firm, but yours is rolling with it. It'll be great. You know what? Just roll with it if it's firm. If it's super firm and it's too thick, you can take um you can take it out, right? And if you want to make it a thinner slice of it, you can try to slice it with a knife because in between the layers, right? You can try to cut through it with a knife and do it if you could do it straight. If you can't, I would suggest lay it down on a flat surface, get some uh, like uh, dental floss and like you could just cut right through it. Ooh, smart. Okay. So, so you just cut like another thin. layer. Got it. Okay, I can do that. All right. So anybody else, if you have a thick, um, gelée, just cut it in half and let's just make it a little bit thinner and Chef Jamil recommends doing it with floss. Yeah. Unflavored floss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me just do a little bit of... Okay, so just so you know where we're at on time, everybody and Chef Jamil, we are at 630. Um, so I think we're probably close to wrapping it up now. Do you want to yes. just show what the final product looks like if you have some and we can just wrap things up or how I'm are doing we it right now? Okay, we, 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 we're stacked together right now. We're going to learn how to assemble the stacks. Let's do it. Yeah, so I'm just doing this because I'm going to torch it a little because I want to get that little like hard sugary glaze on top. So don't torch it on the paper if you're not used to torching on um, parchment paper because you might set the paper on fire. And <laughs> we don't want that. We don't want that. Please don't do that. <laughs> My hands are OK. So I'm just gonna torch mine. You can come in close that. Awesome, my favorite part. And it's just gonna make a nice little glaze on top. And add a, like a little crunch. And I think it's just pretty. Okay, so that's done for mine. That and looks so good. Yummy. Awesome. Okay, so let me make sure I have all my parts. Um, I take a little bit of the pastry cream, the pistachio pastry cream, and just dab a little bit on the bottom, just so that it holds your thing in place. But I forgot a step, because I forgot. I told you guys I made a little bit of the sauce. Yeah, and do you want to just mention how you made it again? Did you reduce I just reduced it. I added sugar, and I just reduced it. I did sugar, and I did a reduction, and pretty much that's all it is it's, and I just use it on everything now ice cream whatever um, I use a paintbrush just to paint it on the plate I give it a little black pepper because that adds nice with my little flavor that little pastry cream I put there just to hold it in place I'm gonna do a layer of the gelée but underneath that I'm gonna put a little bit of this, just because I like the extra. And that's the pistachio chili. That's the crushed um, chili pistachios. The, that's just the okay. pistachios crushed up. And I'm just gonna put a little bit of cocoa nibs on the plate. And then just a layer of the gelée. Another piece of The 
Philo. Pastry cream. And you put as much as you like. Looks so good. When you have a question, we or when you have a second, we have a question about what type of countertops can you torch on? Um, you can torch on metal, you can torch on ceramic. Um, this is the one I'm using, sorry. That's and okay. if you want to add a little more cocoa nib on here, but that's again, if you want to add more texture to your product. The more crunch, the better. It's up to you. Looks so okay. Cool. Um, then I just like garnish with fresh pomegranate. And some more pistachio on top that I mix with the cocoa nib because it looks pretty. And I dust it with powdered sugar. Mm -hmm. And pretty much that is your dessert. Oh my gosh, that looks so good. Can we have people who are, if you want to, you can jump on camera and show what your final product looks like if you're ready to. Um, if not, don't worry about it. Can we get a close up of what that looks like? Yes. Can you see this? Oh my gosh, so beautiful. That looks so good. Okay, now is the part where we get to enjoy a bite together. Mine's still baking, but please go ahead and dig in there. We want to hear the crunch. We want to see your reaction. Everybody who else is ready to enjoy your first bite, please join Chef Jamil. Okay, does, does anybody have one that's ready? Does anybody really have one that's ready? Oh, somebody's asking if you could show the final product one more time. Of course, absolutely. Can you see it? Tilt it down just a teeny bit in your main camera. Yes, that's perfect. There. Oh my God, it looks so good. Amazing. Amazing. Cool. Yes, perfect. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, so this is a messy dessert. I cut mine because I'm fancy. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it can be very messy because you're doing the phyllo. Um, I let it sit and it absorbs some of your cream, your pastry cream. Again, I made it crunchy. So that all of that, um, what we put in there with the paste made it crunchy. But once the pastry cream is sitting there for a little while, it starts to soften, which is why I wanted it crunchy. It's so good. Yeah, you we hear love that hearing that crunch. <laughs> you hear the crunch? I love hearing that crunch. I love it. <laughs> Yummy. I'm going to show you a piece. Yes. Let's get a close up. Oh my gosh. Yum. Again, this is a situation where like you wish you could send the smells through the camera, right? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Mmm. Yum. Mmm, I love all that flavor. I love that it tastes sinful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. The sexy stuff. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's sexy and sustainable. Beautiful. We love it. Okay, you guys, we are like five minutes out mm. from experiencing that sexy and sustainable bite as well. But in the meantime, Chef Jamil, I just want to thank you so, so, so much, not thank only for being guys. here tonight and sharing your wisdom with us, but also developing this original recipe from scratch with new ingredients, sustainable ingredients, vegan ingredients. Thank it's you. I've learned so much personally. I've honestly been somebody who's like always been a scared of pastry cooking. Um, and I feel like I really did learn a lot tonight. So thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you guys um, for having me. Yes. And I also would like to just pop back over to our sponsors for a final word. We want to thank you again, wonderful pistachio. Thank for you guys for being here. 
Yeah, for making tonight possible. We love putting on these events for our community. I know that people get so much out of this. And so thank you, Chef Jamil. Thank you, wonderful pistachios. Thank you, everybody who stayed on a little bit longer to finish up this recipe with us and creating an environment where it really did feel like we were just in our friend's kitchen cooking all together. So back to you, Maggie and Bretta, if you could just uh, share. Yes, she's already on it. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Oh, Maggie, you're muted. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, you're good. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. I think my, um, if you wanna mute my phone, that's fine. I think my earbuds ran out, but um, I had to run to get my thing out of the oven so it wouldn't burn and be more of a nightmare than it was. <laughs> but it was super fun to make. Um, I'm sweating and that was super fun. I um, did a little culinary school, but I did not do the pastry section. So <laughs> that was an adventure. I think that was my first time with phyllo dough. Um, we just wanna say thanks for um, putting this on and allowing uh, wonderful pistachios and Palm Wonderful to be a part of it. Uh, and then I dropped into the chat. Uh, we felt like this audience would be really like-minded in wanting to know about a diversified dietetics uh, webinar on November 10th. So it is quite a far away, a ways off, but I dropped a link. You're, this group is actually the very first to hear about it. So we just have a sign up if you're interested in learning more. Um, uh, Cindy Chu will be going through kind of a tech behind putting on a virtual culinary demo. There'll be a cook along as well. Um, so thank you again for having us here. Thank you, Chef Jamil, for everything. Thank you, Aiton, for having this uh, group together and just really appreciate uh, being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for also sharing this awesome event with Diversify Dietetics with our community. We absolutely love their organization and what they stand for. And I personally love Cindy as well. Um, so we're so excited about that. We will definitely have some members of our community show up there. And thank you to all of our participants for showing up tonight. If you had fun at this event, if you learned a lot, if you made a huge mess, but you still had a great time, <laughs> join us for another future event. We are doing another Cook for the Climate in August with um, a co-host named Ash, who's going to be teaching us how to make a traditional South Indian recipe using chickpeas. We're going to talk about all things related to chickpeas and how they're grown and how they're used in different cultures around the world. Um, and also, again, just one final thank you to wonderful pistachios. Thank you so much for making tonight possible. If you had a great time, join us at Planetary Health Collective on Instagram. Don't forget to tag us in your creations. Let us know how this went for you and join us on our Facebook group by searching Planetary Health Collective. We have events like this several times a month. Um, and so we're always looking to connect with other like-minded individuals. Thank you all so much for being here. I cannot wait to see how yours turned out. I'm about to go eat mine um, probably before it's cooled down sufficiently. <laughs> So thank you all again so much. Thanks. A final thank you to Chef Jamil. Um, thank this you has been guys so much, so much. Thank you. And we'll see you at the next time. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.